rather than uh, tell you the, the whole story, I have a, a short video to, uh, uh, to present to you. Uh, it's very short, but to give you a good, uh, good sense of what we, are, what we are today. Welcome to today's working world. Companies everywhere are working harder and investing more. But achieving the right outcomes has never been more difficult. Xerox engineers a better way for people, process, and technology to work together, improving how the world shops, travels, pleases customers, learns, banks, and stays healthy. So life works better. Work can work better with Xerox. Okay, so maybe a bit surprising because I'm not sure you've seen a copier in that video. Uh, by the way, uh, what we are today, uh, Xerox, is uh, still a leading, a leading uh, you know, company for providing document management services. Uh, but also, you know, we help you know, governments, we help businesses, and to improve the way they, they, they work. And in order to do that, we provide services like customer care. We have about 50,000 agents uh, in call centers at Xerox that are helping telco companies, you know, like Verizon of the world. Uh, we also provide services to healthcare, to hospitals, to local governments, uh, and we also do, uh, uh, you know, uh, transportation services. Like in the Netherlands here, uh, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the, the train company, we provide them with all the services uh, for ticketing and the management of, of, of all that. So we are very, uh, very diverse. Now, there's also a senior issue which is very often associated with Xerox, uh, which is, you know, research and development. And I didn't say innovation, because it's a bit different, but uh, research and development, R&D, um, you may know that in the, in the 1970s, uh, we, invented, we invented some concepts that we still use today uh, in, a, in the IT industry, uh, using windows uh, on the screen to be able to type documents, the notion of what you see on the screen, and what you see is what you get, is what you print, Ethernet, to be able to exchange information between computers, we invented all, the, all that in our labs. So really, we have a, uh, a lineage of you know really developing you know uh, leading edge uh, research and, uh, and development. We do that in the four labs that we have around the world, uh, plus a, a, a partnership with uh, Fuji Xerox. Now, something which is uh, interesting to to get here from the research we do is that you know we develop assets components that can be used in many different types of industries. I mean, let me just give you one, one simple example. Uh, we have designed what we call computer vision technologies that can be used, of course, to enhance the quality of the documents that you print. You know, we change the colors of your documents to the picture so that they print very nicely. But the, the very same technology can be used as well in other domains, like transportation. In transportation, for instance, in the US, uh, we uh, deliver, you know, high-speed cameras. Well, maybe you don't like us for that, but uh, <laughs> you take a picture of you when you drive too fast or when you're on the wrong lane on the, on the highway. And so we have used the same technology in order to be able to read very efficiently the license plates of, of vehicles. So this technology is quite generic. These are components that we can reuse in many different uh, locations. Another thing which is very important is the, uh, the notion of multidisciplinary uh, teams. Not only we have researchers that are very good in designing materials uh, in computer science, but we also have ethnographers, people who are very good at observing how you work, and they will then to provide you with advice and advise our researchers on how to better design technologies. So it's not only you know hard science, but also soft science like eth ethnography that we are we are using. Now. Another thing to, to understand, that's going to be my last slide about you know, the, the decorum, but uh, uh, we have a strategic account management uh, organization. We call it you know, uh, Global Accounts, or GAO. And it's divided by sectors. We have four different sectors. Uh, four years ago, one very interesting thing that was done in order to leverage you know, research and development with strategic accounts is that we've decided to group Sorry. We decided to group together, uh, okay, group together the strategic accounts organization with research and development. And so we were all under the umbrella of operations. And there was also a mandate that was given by the head of uh, corporate operations. He's a French guy as well. 
and with his good you know, French accent, he said, you need to connect the dots. Meaning that he really wanted us to connect research and strategic accounts. And that's really something that I've been uh, reading over the past, uh, the past years. Now, as I said, this is just for the decorum so that you understand, you know, the certain bits and pieces we put in place in order to maximize uh, the value of, uh, of, uh, of R&D with strategic accounts. Now, over the last two days here, I've heard a lot, you know, uh, yes, you know, innovation is key. Innovation is very important, you know, with strategic accounts. Uh, but I think one thing which is to be understood is, you know, what do we really mean by, by innovation and why we, want to, uh, why we want to do it with strategic accounts. Uh, so I think it's, it was really shared here that innovation is not only technology. I mean, there are many different ways to innovate, you know, with strategic accounts. We say we can innovate, you know, with different business models. We can innovate looking at our customers, you know, supply chain processes and help them with that. However, however, when we talk about innovation, very often there's a technology component which into that. I mean, Bernard shared yesterday, you know, using IoT, for instance, and the power of data analytics the data can provide. And you need tools, you need really very powerful technologies in order to be able to invent new services and technologies you deliver, deliver to your customers. So there's very often a technology component inside, you know, the, uh, the notion of co-innovation. Now, however, uh, not every invention is an innovation. Uh, I love this, uh, this picture here. Uh, that's clearly an invention. I mean, this is not Xerox. Uh, that's something I found, it's a patent, I mean, it's a US patent. I, I had to write down, you know, what it's made for because, I mean, I can't see what you would use that for. I'm not so sure I understand, but uh, I read it's uh, a user-operated amusement apparatus for kicking the user buttocks. So, okay, well, uh, that's an interesting invention. However, it's not really an innovation. Be behind innovation, there's really the notion of creating value, and I'm not sure you can really, you can create pain with that, but I'm not sure you create value with that sort of things. So, why innovating, why do you want to innovate with strategic, uh, with strategic accounts? Well, I think the main reason is what, what I just said, is really the, uh, the idea of leverage respective you know, strength to jointly create value. So you want to leverage your assets, your R&D, you want to do that with your customer, and jointly you want to create some, uh, some value. Now there's also a very interesting point about innovating with customers, and, and maybe because at Zero, you know, we are very much you know, sales oriented, is the way that it could be opening doors with the C-suite. I mean, I've seen that many times, you know, with the company managers at Xerox, who come, you know, well, you know, like, we are the best in document management, and um, you try to talk to the C-level, uh, to the CTO, to the CEO of the company, and very often it's like, well, thank you, Mr. Xerox, but uh, can you talk to the purchase manager because for the copiers, that's, he deals with that. And so when you start to talk about innovation, you start to tell the customer, hey, we can help you to improve your processes, solve your pain points. We have many assets in our R&D that could be leveraged. That's really a, a great door, door opener. And of course, if you have created this relationship with your, uh, with your strategic account, uh, it's a way as well to nurture and develop this uh, relationship. Now, being very selfish, I told you I have a uh, half of my soul in research. There's also a very important point about co-innovating with customers. That's the fact that you have access to an incredible source of knowledge for R&D. More and more R&D is also using data. And data is very difficult to get. Now, if you develop a very strong relationship and a coordination relationship with your strategic account, you'll have a much better access to its, uh, to its data. And also, knowledge, market knowledge, and all that sort of thing. So that's really something very interesting from an R&D perspective. Uh, so it seemed like a, uh, a simple journey. Like, hey, fantastic. Hey, you want to create Let's do it. Once upon a time, so it was yourself, you know, strategic account manager, and on the other side, you have the strategic account, and you are you know, making progress, you know, making a relationship, yeah, working well. Uh, in the middle, well, you have customers. You're strategic account customers, 
you know, we have also to take them into the equation. And by the way, they can also be your customers. So then you start to talk about, you know, join go to market and some new products and technology. Then it gets a bit more complicated. And now you have this strange beast coming, you know, global research and development. And honestly, I know these guys very well. I know the community very well. They have really different mindsets than you have in, in sales. Oh, they want to develop intellectual property. They want to publish at conferences. Uh, do they care about you know, making a better product, delivering to the customer? Ah, not always. I mean, it's not always the case. So you have to deal with these strange people. Another one you have to deal with is uh, intellectual property. Uh, you go and see your, uh, your, con your, your uh, IP council, and it will tell you you're not thinking of co-innovating. I mean, it's like this is very difficult to do. You mean you're going to share patents with a, uh, another company? I don't really know how well to do that. It's going to be problems, blah, 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 etc. Okay, you have to work with these guys. The next one uh, is the operations and delivery. It's good to work with research. They have good ideas. Sometimes they have not very good ideas on how to implement this. So you have to in involve the operations and delivery people. Another element to add in the equation. The next one is strategy. I take a Xerox and say, hey, I have this great co-innovation project with my customer. What do you think of that? And they say, well, are you sure this is something which is corresponding to an industry, an industry trend? Is it only for your customer, or is that something you can replicate to others? So they come also into play. And the last one, last but not least, finance. We don't have money to help you co-develop, co-innovate. You have to be very innovative as well in finding uh, funding. So, your role as a SAM is to be in the middle of all that. I mean, yesterday Thomas talked about you know being the rock star. I think it's really the orchestrator. So this is not a rock star, it's more kind of a ladybug who has to connect all these dots together in order at the end to be able to co-innovate with the customer. So it doesn't sound like a very easy journey. However, when you manage to do it, it's really uh, rewarding and very, very, um, in terms of return on investment, very, very interesting. So why is it so difficult? I think you've understood the complexity of the equation that you have to deal, uh, to deal with. The first point is uh, that I think it's very easy to generate excitement. I mean, it's like you take a customer to a research center and you have these you know, very excited researchers telling him about, you know, we could do these nice things and we could go to the moon and to Mars, etc. Uh, at the end, it's like, how are we going to deliver all that? Well, that's another story. So excitement, easy to generate excitement, but difficult to deliver. I told you already about a, a bit about that. Sales and research development. Two very different objectives. Sales, you want to sell quickly, you know, uh, next quarter if possible. And research is like, yes, well, we have a program on that. We could, co we could, we could have co-development, but uh, if we come to market maybe in the next three years. Then. We don't want to have that. Another one is that very often you come with opportunities they never, never come at the right time for research and de 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 development. There's a notion of desynchronization. I, I will tell you a bit more about that, but you know, they, in research and development, there's an agenda, there are programs. It's always very difficult to insert a customer co-innovation activity uh, inside, of, inside of that. Now, these are the things that uh, uh, observed, I have observed. Now, let me give you a few tips on uh, what we've put in place in order to, uh, to be able to work better with regard to all these, uh, these, uh, these issues. And last one I said, yeah, of course, uh, funding is also very, uh, very key, and we also work quite creative on uh, being able to fund the projects. Now, the first thing is, as I said, you know, generate excitement, uh, making sure you, know, you, you create the right opportunity for the customer, but to know that to be efficient in co-innovation, you really need to know each other very well. You need to know your customer, your customer needs to uh, know you uh, as well. Um, I, very often I represent this kind of activity as know your customer, know each other, as a kind of pyramid. Uh, and at the end we propose you know, different options so that you know, we provide awareness and we provide you know, engagement mechanisms as well that are quite powerful. At the bottom, you will find a, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the the, the, the place where the involvement of R&D is, is not very important. And you don't have a lot of intimacy with the, with the, with the customer. So that's everything about communicating, what we do in research, 
Uh, we do that on the web, of course, on social media more and more. I mean, on LinkedIn, we publish very regularly, uh, you know, posts about our activity research. And so that creates, you know, awareness, uh, you know, within uh, our customers. There's something else, with, something else we have created as well, which is called the Smart Pad. And that's, a, that's an iPad application that we give to our sales team and the, and the staff as well. And on this iPad, they have all the assets uh, that we do in research. You know, and uh, it's, it's a way to give, you know, to make connection with your customers, start to talk about innovation. So a few slides, a few videos, you know, articles, and so they can sort of socialize what could be innovation. That's really uh, a kind of a, the first step. The next step is that we have innovation centers. Uh, we call them you know, executive briefing centers. I mean, many of you have got these things as well all around the world uh, with teams that are facilitating, facilitating and managing these, these, uh, 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 these locations. Uh, we have in Europe, in the US, uh, quite a lot as well as in, uh, in, in Canada. Uh, and we can welcome you know, with, you know, our clients over there. Okay. Very classic. Uh, everyone does that, I believe. Uh, but but when you do, when you invite these customers, there's not an in-depth discussion, it's like show and tell. You know, our CTO calls that the dog and pony show. It's like it's nice, great, you can dance everybody <laughs> on the stage, but uh, not an in-depth conversation. Strategic accounts, we start to engage them at this level. This is what we call the dreaming sessions. Uh, I mean Amsterdam, so it's not about smoking some uh, you know, strange you know, chemicals or whatever, <laughs> but it's all about dreaming with our customers and trying to understand how the research assets that we have could be used in the customer environment. And I'll be tell you a bit more about uh, how we do uh, how we do sort of things. At the top of the pyramid, you have what we call the innovation councils. That's something that we've created for just a few customers. And it's almost creating a full innovation ecosystem, you know, with our customer, with dedicated resources to that. Now, a few words about these dreaming sessions. Um, so, that's, you know, a moment. Usually it lasts, you know, one day to two days. And that's really the moment where we are inviting our strategic accounts to come to our research centers to explain us, and just that, to explain us what are the challenges, what are the strategic imperatives, and we make them, you know, imagine how they could use some of the assets we have, some of the technologies that we, uh, that we have. So that's the visible part. However, prior to doing these dreaming sessions, there's a lot of work which is happening. We are involving our multidisciplinary team, as I said, that work with the SAM in order to understand, you know, what's the situation with the accounts, what they are expecting, what their problems, what are the trends of this industry. And we start talking, we start socializing that as well with the, uh, with the customer. We create a technology vision, so we select the assets as they are, that could be interesting. We also talk with the customer and select his assets as well, that would be interesting to add uh, to the party. We run the dreaming session, so it's really brainstorming, it's generating ideas, etc. However, at the end of that, it's always very easy to say, 100 ideas, great, thank you very much. And the worst remark I can have is that the day was great, food was good. But you know, it's like, and what about the technology transfer and the ideas? That's a sign that the workshop did not, uh, did not work. So a good dream session, we usually come with you know, a maximum of three ideas that we are going to pursue. And the three ideas, we move to the next steps, this time with more with a project team that will involve research and development, but also the delivery teams will start to customize the assets that we have with the customer and start to deliver a pilot, a pilot that will be tested you know, on a small kind of a, on small scale. And if the pilot is successful, then we move to the next steps, which is you know becoming bigger, and then obviously at some point. Not only this solution will be able for with one customer, but we will uh, propose it to the uh, uh, to a, a, a complete sector. And so these sessions, they've been very powerful. Uh, they work very well. However, and I'll come back to that. We don't do them for every account. Uh, we ask the SAM, especially in that phase, you know, at the beginning, we ask them to be very selective. You know, they always ask for, hey, I want to do a drilling session. Okay, let's see together what we can do. 
And what you can turn into a case is a session where we can share knowledge, we can share what we've been researched. But obviously, because the account, because the, uh, the customer is not ready for co-innovation, <laughs> for code innovation, we know that we will turn it into uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, whole, the whole value chain. Now, a second point I wanted to make is about the timing and synchronizing you know, the different activities. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that sort of thing. You know, that's, it, it represents, I think, quite well the way research works. It, it, it's a funnel. It's a funnel that uh, shows that uh, here you do, uh, at this point, you do uh, a lot of uh, what we call blue sky research. So researchers are very good at generating many ideas. Uh, they, don't really know, uh, they don't really know how to implement them, but very good at doing that. As, as, you, as you are maturing your, your technologies, you have reviews, you, know, you select some projects and uh, you, uh, you exclude some, uh, some others. In, in our terminology, we talk of these things as, as exploration. The next one is incubation. So this is purely research uh, involved. And here, you start to involve operations, delivery, uh, and all uh, these people. The next stage is redevelopment. So that's really hand-in-hand -hand activity with the operations. You're really talking about delivering a solution to the market and then commercialize. Then guess what? If you try to involve your uh, strategic accounts here, that will not work. Because here the researchers they need a lot of you know a lot of freedom on the, on the, on thinking, etc. There are other ways to work with partners, you know, like grants we could get from government, from the European Union, but that's usually the strategic accounts are not involved to that. The baseline to have a rock star, yeah, that's a rock star, is really here in the incubation phase. Because that's where you, you are evol you know, you're evaluating different ways to commercialize your assets and your technologies. And that's where, really, where you want to have the in depth conversation, the dreaming sessions, you know, with the with with strategic accounts. So I think it's very important that you are aware of that sort of, a, of, this, uh, of this activity. And to be able to know your researchers as well, know them so that you know in which stage they are with their research. If a researcher starts to tell you, yes, I want to go to Mars, uh, well, unless you're Lockheed Martin or this company, I mean, you should not go into that uh, stage. Okay. Now, something again about knowing your, knowing your, your, your people, knowing your customers, it's also knowing very much totally what you, what you, what you have. And it's part of knowing this, uh, this pipeline. Um, in order to have the strategic accounts to understand what we do in research, we really organize on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, we don't call it innovation days. We are, you know, say, meetings that are taking place in our innovation centers, in our research centers, where science from the specific sector are invited, but not only to listen to what crazy researchers are doing, but also to share what they see as the issues they have with their strategic accounts, the trends of the market. And so for the researchers, it's very much listening to what's going on in some specific sectors. We do that in all the research centers that we have in Europe and in Europe and the uh, United States. And we really ask the SAM, who are very smart, very smart people, to challenge the researchers and help them to pivot, to change the way they see the technology to look at a, uh, you know, a, a different application. Let me just give you a simple example here of something that happened very recently. Um, I told you we are in transportation. It's a bit of a surprise, but yes, Xerox is a, uh, a big actor in transportation. And uh, beginning of the year, we launched in Los Angeles uh, an application which is called uh, Go LA. And the aim of this app is to help people who are traveling in LA uh, to get to their destination, but using all types of transportation. It can be you're in your car, you're stuck on the highway, and using our, our app, we can tell you, hey, you can use this parking lot over there. By the way, we can book uh, a location for you. And then you take a public transport. Maybe if you like cycling like I do, you'll finish the last night by renting also a bike, and you'll get to your destination you know, at the right time. So we've launched this application for LA. The customer was you know, uh, the LA transportation department. Uh, however, when we showed that to strategic accounts, what they told us is like, wait a minute, I mean, that would be very interesting for my account. I have an account who uh, wants to show itself as you know, being a sustainable you know, company, 
so they want to be greener. And so they have made relationships with, uh, with taxi companies that are using you know, hydrogen-based vehicles. Uh, and they are promoting all sorts of alternative ways uh, to, uh, to have transportation in a city. And they said, look, if you take this application, you do it like white label. And uh, we say, you know, this is the name of the customer. We incorporate here the operators, the companies they are working with. That's really a very new solution we could provide them, and we could calculate, you know, the number of, uh, you know, the kilograms of or, or tons of CO2 they are sending, and all that sort of things. So that's really an example of pivoting when technology was developed in a certain domain into another one, into another one, and we really push, you know, these conversations to uh, to, to happen. Now, another one is about uh, another point is about funding. What we've learned about funding. I told you really the uh, the lesson learned was that really there's money uh, available uh, to be able to innovate, co-innovate with uh, with strategic accounts. Uh, research and development say, hey, we have our, our budgets. Uh, it's already dedicated to the products we need to deliver. And uh, strategic accounts say, you know, guys, we don't have money. We don't do investments. So we've been creative in uh, trying to. Uh, to help uh, innovation to happen. The, the one thing we did was to create an innovation fund which is embedded into a deal when we sign a deal with a customer. I mean, we, it's not always the case, but we really push for that. And the aim is to dedicate every year, you know, some money, it can be, you know, $500,000 or euros, dedicated every year to co-innovation. And that's something that proved you know, to work quite well. You know, we saw the accounts that are accepted to do that, the strategic account manager as well as the account itself. However, I said, you know, it's just for some accounts. Uh, as it was not sufficient, we had more demand. Uh, we decided to create an innovation fund this time, which is directly managed by the strategic account uh, you know, uh, group at, at Xerox. So it's a small fund at the moment. It's, uh, it's $1 million. And uh, we propose, you know, all the time to use this, uh, this term. Uh, the basis is that uh, we have three submissions of projects a year. So the, year, the, the submissions are proposed by, by the SAM. We really ask them to look at projects that have a short duration. So it's only six months. Because, you know, we want to be fast and we want to show results quite rapidly. So it means that technology should be, uh, you know, mature enough to be, uh, you know, uh, co-developed with the customers on the six months uh, period. Uh, we ask for co-funding, meaning that we ask the customer as well to contribute to the funding, you know, half in half. So it can be real money, but it can be as well, you know, uh, in-kind resources and that sort of things. Three submissions, they are reviewed by, of course, the customer, but also uh, the, uh, the CTO of Xerox and the capabilities as well, uh, vice presidents. They all agree that, yes, we want to go with this strategic account, we want to dedicate money to this, uh, to this project. Another thing which is uh, important is that we also involve strategy because we want to find projects, we want to, to fund projects that make sense for one customer first, but then that can be expanded to a, uh, a whole sector. You know, IBM has got this word which is a you know, notion of first of a kind. You start with an account, but then you expand it to other, uh, other areas. And that's really been a way for us really to uh, re you know, go through the problems of funding uh, some of these, uh, some of these, uh, these projects. And I can tell you, there's a lot of competition. You know, uh, there are many. There, there are more proposals than we can fund. So we we hope to have the fund to be uh, bigger than it is uh, today. Now, the last thing I wanted to share with you is kind of this is the top of the pyramid. You know what I, I call you know the innovation uh, innovation council as a best practice. So that's something we put in place with just a very few accounts. The idea of the council is that you put an organization, its people, that are going to be fully dedicated to co-innovation with one account. And I said we've done that with uh, just a few. So we need to be very, very selective with that. Selective means that you want to make sure that your account is really open to innovating you know, with another company. I mean, there are some good examples. I mean, some companies are very well known for that. You have P&G, for instance. Or you have, you have also Ford. Ford recently complete, created a complete new ecosystem to involve you know, partners uh, in order to develop products and solutions that are delivered then by, by Ford to its, uh, to its customers. But there are, there are many others. Uh, now, about this console, 
what it is, uh, as I said, the, the, the goal, the strategy purpose is really enhance clients' organizational performance, productivity, competitiveness through joint innovation. When we do that, we focus on specific domains. You know, we don't boil the ocean. We try to be specific, like, for instance, it's going to be on sustainability, it's going to be on mobility, uh, and also productivity. So very broad domains, but we decide to uh, we focus on some, uh, some specific ones. That's a console which is you know, managed, co-shared by the CTO of Xerox, as well as you know, uh, with senior vice presidents that are involved you know, from both parties uh, in, this, uh, in this console. Then the modalities, you know, there are, of course, quarterly meetings that are taking place. Uh, they are, you know, day-to-day -day working on different projects. We use tools as well that you wouldn't find, you know, in, in the pure in innovation ecosystem in any company. Uh, Scorecard to be able to evaluate how the projects are going. But also this tool, which is very interesting. We call that the balanced portfolio. It's portfolio management. Uh, it's something we use in research. And this idea of portfolio management is that you classify the ideas and the projects by you know, the business value, but also the speed of delivery. And what you want to have when you start this innovation council, you have a portfolio where you have projects that will deliver you know, their fruits, uh, their, their value on the short term, but you want also to look at mid-term. So these are the ones that are here on this, uh, on this quadrant. And you want to make sure that this is well balanced so that you have new ideas that will generate value in the future. Very powerful, expensive to put in place, so just do that with a few accounts. Just a few things that came out of these innovation councils, and you will, I think you'll get the value. Um, one application is what we call mobile printing. Uh, I, you all have mobile phones, uh, and very often you know, we would like to print from these mobile phones. And something that seemed you know, a bit obvious, like uh, for us six years ago, especially for the customers we worked with. That's a customer who wanted to be more, again, greener, more sustainable. And he said, we want to stop printing. We love Xerox, but yeah, enough with printing. <coughs> and uh, we told them, hey, but well, we can help you to do that. And helping them was trying to understand, maybe not print less, but print better. And one of the needs that they had was really they needed to be able to print wherever they were in the corporation, with their laptops, but also smartphones, etc. And so we co-developed really the technology with them. It's been piloted and delivered to this customer and delivered them to the whole industry. Another example with another customer with the Innovation Council uh, is in the domain of packaging. So that's not a domain where we were at all uh, in the past. You know, we were volume printers, uh, but uh, not, not much in packaging. What this customer had as a problem is that he wanted to address this niche market, which is very personalized packaging, you know, it's like uh, like these Coke bottles, where every package is different from the uh, the other ones, or very small lots, you know, the sort of things. When you want to do that at very high speed, you need really to have very very good technologies in order to be able to do that sort of things. So we've co-developed with this customer a whole set of machines, we have machines in order to be able to develop this personalized packaging uh, capability. High value for our customer, because the price of these personalized goods is much higher than you know, standard goods. And high value for Xerox, because it was a way for us to better understand this market, and understand if we have to go there. A very last example, uh, more recent. I told you we are also in the customer care world, so we have many agents in call centers taking calls, trying to solve your problems with your iPhone and all these devices. Uh, however, one of our customers, uh, a strategic account, told us uh, about two years ago, he said, look, you know, this world is just crazy. I mean, call centers, you are doing, all, you know, we outsource call centers to use Xerox. However, you are today delivering the service from the Philippines. It's a low-cost country. Where do you want to go next? I mean, it's very difficult to be even cheaper and cheaper and still keeping the quality uh, of, of, uh, of the relationship with the customer. So the researchers on their side, they were you know, using a lot of artificial intelligence, uh, intelligent dialogues with the software and human being, etc. And so we've co-designed you know, with this strategic account, uh, you know, what we call the next generation customer care. 
And it's all about, instead of having agents, real people, it's all about having robots, software robots, that are acting as people. And it's, what is done in that field is amazing. I mean, you really have the impression that you are talking or conversing with a real, uh, a real human, to the point that these robots can also adapt to your style, if you are extrovert, introvert, and uh, you know, really adapt to conversation to that. And that's, again, uh, another thing, both uh, valid for both, uh, both parties, for Xerox and the customer. So these were just a few examples of the practices we had at Xerox. I told you, I, told, I was going to tell you about things that don't work, but these things are majority work. But a few lessons for that, from, from that I would like to share. Uh, the first thing is that, unfortunately, I, I don't think that, you know, co-innovation is a process. <laughs> Very much, I think this is an art. Uh, Thomas yesterday talked about, you know, hey, you are a rock star. I think, yes, that's really a, a, an art for the rock star to, uh, to be able to deliver co-innovation with the customers. It's aligning stars. Uh, there needs to be cultural fit between the two companies. Uh, you want to show your partner is ready to innovate, is open. Uh, there's something very strong, which is understand your people, understand your assets, understand where they are in their research and technology to better, uh, to better connect to them. Provide a co-creation environment. I told you, research centers, hosting people, it's more than that. Having the people who are able to communicate and listen to your customers. And of course, funding is key really. You must really be innovative as well in the, in the funding. Now, with all the recipes, uh, will that work? Well, yes, I believe it gives you some clues, you know, to have a, you know, very high success. You know, it's very linked as well to uh, the C-level sponsorship. You've seen in Innovation Council, driven by the CTOs, they are the ones that are really able to drive the whole machinery, really, and the same is key. So that was my last message. Uh, I'd say this is something that we designed for rock stars. Uh, and by the way, I'm very happy to be a uh, not a rock star, but I'm also <laughs> you know, helping the rock stars you know, to make good music with our customers. So I play drums, that's good. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This was uh, very, very original. Thank you. Uh, out of the box. Uh, very easily and well, very easy to understand and write at the core. Of strategy growth with uh, with strategy customers. Uh, you know, at Sama, uh, we believe again and again and again that most of the organic growth of the future will come from the customers. It will not come from blockbusters or R&D. It will be coming from this kind of approach. So I thought this was a very, very well done. Uh, Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. We have, uh, I have questions, but maybe the audience has, of course. has questions. So, mm -hmm. please. Okay, I have so there's, there's no questions. Go ahead. I'm going to ask, I think, how can you scale an approach like that? Mm -hmm. Because you, you describe this as kind of an, an art form, mm -hmm. right? You grab a few scientists, you mm -hmm. grab the most mm -hmm. enlightened sand, mm -hmm. and you do it. Mm -hmm. You envision doing Hundreds of thousands of those in the future? Well, it, it's already, uh, even though I said this is not, uh, th there's, uh, there's really an organization which is supporting that. Uh, so, thousands, I'm not sure. Uh, you see, we have 50 strategic accounts. Um, and uh, th there's really, at the moment, we have the resources. As I said, we have, you know, we have researcher, researchers. We have put in place, you know, these options to be able to interact, you know, with our strategic accounts. And, uh, and that's really a, uh, something which is well organized in order to be able to host you know, all these sessions and really co develop with customers. <coughs> However, um, as I said, at the end, not everything will transform into uh, an actionable you know, plan. Um, it, it's hard to give you a, a, a figure of how much of these, uh, these, uh, these moments we transform into a, a, a real, real project, but honestly, I think trying to make the calculation uh, uh, in real time, it's not more than 20%, honestly, at, at the moment. So there's, there's you know, room for, for improvement, but uh, as I said, you know, we, we prefer you know, to select you know, some accounts, the right teams, and be successful rather than you know, boil the ocean and to have a very low success rate. So 
we could certainly uh, we could certainly do more, but uh, we need to be selective and uh, in, in respect, you know, I said the different pace of developments of, uh, of all parties. Other questions? I have one. Yes. Um, so obviously the speed mm -hmm. is very quick. Yeah. The cycle time. Yeah. Now you said, and I heard you that uh, you know you have to involve customers at the right time. Yes. And you talked about uh, you know that second phase where you know you want to really go straight to a prototype. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that uh, successful development uh, comes from a lot of upstream work to mm -hmm. debug technology mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. making sure that mm -hmm. downstream we don't have you know, issues. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the quality of the, of the definition of the, of the problem, mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you have a good success rate in doing that with customers? I, I, no, you, you, you raise a very good, uh, a very good point, Bernard, which is uh, how you manage to understand each other and the quality of you know how you formulate the, the, right. the problem from the from the start. Right. And um, I would say that uh, usually these skills do not come from the researchers uh, or people that are you know like working in hard science, and that's where we leverage the other disciplines. Uh, having ethnographers on board that are very versed into observing people, reformulating questions, etc., are really, really helpful in helping us to prepare you know, for, the, for the journey. So that, that's, I, I think it's key to have people that have these soft skills you know, in dialogue, uh, which is very, very important. Um, so yeah, that, that's something which is you know, critical, the quality of you know, the discussion and the, uh, the insights you can get from, uh, from, uh, from that. On the quality of the assets as well, uh, the, you need to make sure that at least the ideas of your researchers, you know, they make they make sense. You know, they, they can be transformed into into reality, and, and that's something which is done usually by other means, like you know, you have researchers participating to conferences, sharing what they do with others, and so with this kind of benchmark and sharing, they know if they are on the right trend or or, or not as well. But I think you you, you say I think they. Having these soft skills, you know, of people that are very versed into, you know, the conversation, ethnography, studying how people work, is, is key to make this uh, to understand the real problem. Okay. Uh, yes. You know, yesterday we talked about product owners, customer relation. Mm -hmm. and you were talking R and D and strategic account. Yeah. You did talk about product center, product development. Yeah. And how do they? No, you're right. I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's a very good point. So uh, about you know the involvement of the product, you know the product teams, you know that's why I call the operations and capabilities on our side. So they are part, definitely part of the conversation. That's one lesson we've learned. Uh, I would say 15 years ago, it was very much a dialogue between research and SAP, and so we were staying at the level of you know nice day, thank you, good food, and when we. Um, when we realized that we were not maximizing the value, we involved, of course, the product development groups as well. It's been a kind of cultural shift for them because they were not used to be so much in touch with the, uh, with the customer. But uh, we, we are really now involving them into the whole, the whole equation, it, it really even the, uh, the, initial, uh, the initial discussions. Now, regarding to the budget I mentioned, yes, this is a small budget. This is really a, a start. And that's really something to, initial, to initiate a, a pilot. Uh, sometimes it's you know, a feasibility study with a prototype, not really more than that. But as we are getting more interest, and uh, usually if after having done a, a very first and small pilot, I mean, in our world, at least then, of course, there will be more funding that we provide this time by the, uh, the product teams, etc. But that's really a kind of an initial funding that we are putting in place. I have a question, if I may, uh, which is about differentiation. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely see that customer A wants you to co-create an innovative idea. Yeah. 
customer A wants that innovation with you to give them differentiation. However, you want to co-innovate in order to extend that innovation elsewhere in the market. So how do you manage the tension between exclusivity and rollout? That, that's a very, uh, again, very good question, very good comments. Um, I would say here there's, there's no rule. I mean, there's no systematic rule. It will depend a lot on the size of the opportunity, on the, uh, the speed of development of this market as well. But what we want to achieve is what you described. You know, we want to start with the customer. We want to give them, or usually they ask for exclusivity, as you said, especially if this is a technology that gets into their, their, their premises. Uh, and, and then we have a negotiation. You know, it's all into negotiation. But for Xerox, we want to move from exclusivity as fast as we can. So there's tension, there's negotiation. That's where the SAM gets into play with all this talent you know, for, for negotiating as well as you know, with the product divisions. But uh, no, there, there's tension. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a good answer to give you, but there is definitely this tension. But as I said, there are many components to take into uh, consideration, many other facts like you know, potential size of the market and also the speed of when this market will, will mature so that we can reach out to other, to other customers. Andres? True. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of value in piloting, but as you said, there's limitations. You, I mean, how can you be sure that you've piloted with the customer that what the, the feedback you get is applicable to the rest, uh, the rest of the world? Um, and, and by the way, yes, we, we have pilots, you know, uh, that just failed, and that doing that failing is already very good information. <laughs> what you need to do is to analyze why the pilot failed. You know, is that because you know. Uh, lack of level of engagement, or because you you are not answering, you know, really the needs of this uh, of this customer. So uh, this analysis then needs to uh, then needs to be done. Uh, however, what we are what we try to do, as I said, we you know we have these assets that are quite generic, and then we try to apply it to different types of application. I gave you the example with the computer vision, for instance. And so, if we fail in a domain, uh, that doesn't mean that this key component cannot be used for another, another uh, thing. Let me just give you a, a very interesting example. Um, uh, we had, as part of the Innovation Council, uh, we had developed, along with the, uh, the mobile printing technology, a way to really do secure printing, uh, meaning that you were really sending to a printer a document that was encrypted uh, in such a way that um, you know, your, your key was not made public, etc., etc. And as part of that, we had designed a technology that we called Pollen. And uh, it was a way to disseminate a certain number of things across a, across a network. And uh, for some reasons, what we had seen as, you know, secure printing uh, was not successful. It was too complex uh, to put in place. There was a lot of resistance from our customers to do that. So we went to something much more simpler. Uh, so that was uh, like, I think it was six years ago. Now, this pollen technology, we've used it very recently uh, to, uh, for in the transportation world. So very different way. In transportation, what we do is that in order to make uh, mobile payments uh, you know, from smartphone, we use the same concept of pollinizing. I don't want to give you the details. But we've been really able to reuse this asset in a very different domain, and this time this is uh, this is successful. So um, we, we try not to look, not to bury too much the, uh, the innovation. We we lucky that uh, uh, at the moment people at Xerox in the R&D field, you know, they've been there for, for quite some time, so they have the memory of what has been done, what has not worked. But it's uh, would be great to have a, a good knowledge, you know, management system to be able to share that. But it's uh, I think it's a bit of a dream. <laughs>
Exactly. Yes. Um, no, this is not something we've done uh, from the start. Uh, as I said, you know, this change happened a few years back. Um, there's a, there, there are some other sales organizations that are that were much more kind of a geographic driven, so, you know, by territory, etc. Even though now they are moving to more kind of a, of industry segments, as uh, for for the SAMs, by the way. Uh, but um, there's a. Um, you know, the, the reason why it was uh, under, uh, under operations, uh, one of the motivators was clearly to work much closer with research and development. Because we saw a lot of synergies. Uh, we had already case studies of people having work with strategic accounts, you know, R&D strategic accounts. However, to maximize real value, we thought that it was, you know, the best, really the best, the best match. Um, now, uh, it means that there are Tensions have been created between the strategic accounts, you know, organization in operations and the local sales uh, organizations as well. So it's it's very much a matter of balance. Uh, there are many bridges that have been created, you know, between the sales organizations so that you know they don't you know fall walk on the other toes, etc. Uh, but uh, I mean, one of, as I said, one of the key things were very you know connect connect these dots, and I, I think it's been quite successful. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Very technical, but really exciting. <laughs> very relevant. So we are going to uh, we are going to break. Uh, you know, session start very soon. Uh, Jen, when do we start the session? Sam Academy starts now. Um, we let your instructors know we're running a few minutes behind, and then the conference breakout session will start at nine forty-five. Well, have a good coffee break.